Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELEX webinar on Organizing for Change. This will serve as session two in our two-part virtual pre-conference on advocating for your department and library. I'm Erin Elsey, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenter today is Emily Drabinsky. Emily is critical pedagogy librarian at the Graduate Center at City University of New York and member of the Professional Staff Congress, CUNY. She edits Gender and Sexuality and in Information Studies, a book series from Library Juice Litwin Books, and sits on the editorial boards of Radical Teacher and College and Research Libraries. She was secretary of the Long Island University Faculty Federation during the management lockout of 2016 and served as president in fall 2018. Emily brings much expertise to today's topic and we're fortunate to have her with us. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is ALCTSAC19, or you can also see it up there in the top left of my slide that's showing. However, we do not monitor the Twitter feed live, so if you have questions for our presenter, please type them into the question box on your GoToWebinar screen. We'll have time for the questions at the end of the presentation, but you can enter the question at any time throughout the webinar. If we do not get to your question, Emily has kindly agreed to answer remaining questions in writing, which will be sent out to all attendees. This webinar is being recorded, and you'll receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the webinar concludes. And now I'll turn it over to Emily. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm so glad to be talking with everyone about uh, organizing for change and really so pleased to be part of the Alex pre-conference uh, over the next, over, over yesterday and today. Um, as I'm sure you will gather from uh, my presentation, I don't think anything that we do in our lives and in our work is more important than organizing uh, collectively to sort of make the change that we want to see in our libraries and in our world. Uh, and so today I'm going to talk a bit about my experience organizing during uh, a management lockout and what I learned from that experience and how I think those skills uh, are skills that all of us have because of our positions in libraries that make us sort of natural organizers, um, as well as uh, um, sort of how we can take unions or knowledge about how, how to build power and transfer it to sort of thinking about how we build power in our own uh, context and institutions. Uh, so a little about me, this is uh, uh, sort of my credentials. I'm a new librarian at the Graduate Center at the City University of New York, supporting the School of Labor and Urban Studies and uh, serving as critical pedagogy librarian. Uh, so I've been in this position for two and a half months. People ask me what that means to be critical pedagogy librarian. I'm not quite sure, uh, but ask me in a year and I think I'll have some ideas. So one caveat before I get started. I am really new at this and I am trying to learn and share as I go. While I do think that there are some skills that we need to build and some expertise that we can we can get from uh, doing organizing work, it's also a really iterative process, uh, involves a lot of mistakes. Uh, learning and sharing as we go, uh, as we think about how to build collective power is something that I'm really committed to. So uh, as Aaron said, I'm happy to answer questions after the webinar join me on Twitter. I'm always talking about this kind of stuff and uh, regularly talk with people who are interested in organizing in their workplaces uh, and just sort of talking through ideas. So learning and sharing, I think, is really uh, central to this project. So I'll give you an example. <clears throat> I'm in a new union now, the Professional Staff Congress at CUNY. Prior to this, I was uh, in the fac at Long Island University Faculty Federation at Long Island University downtown Brooklyn. So we had an action that we did uh, at commencement last week. Currently, my uh, union, the, the union here at, at CUNY is out of contract. We are demanding fair wages for our part-time employees, demanding uh, fair salary increases for everyone, healthcare, retirement, the bread and butter issues of a workplace. 
we wanted to, at commencement, have everyone wear a sticker. Okay, so uh, this was one of the actions that was planned. I'm new here, didn't quite know what to do, <laughs> showed up. Uh, commencement starts at 11, uh, or the students are meant to line up at 11. We want every single student to be wearing a sticker. Uh, we were told to show up at 10.45. And when I got there, I realized that if you are uh, graduating, you're very excited about that, and you don't show up at 10.45 for line up at 11, you show up much earlier than that. Spend time with your friends and your family, take pictures in front of the venue. It's a learning iterative process. So that's sort of an example. So next commencement, when do you think we will start showing up to hand out stickers? Not at 10.45, probably at 9.30, right? So learning and sharing as we go and building these skills is sort of uh, one of the, the sort of take homes of the session today. So where did I begin doing a lot of this learning? That's what I'd like to talk about next. So I was a faculty librarian at Long Island University in downtown Brooklyn, and in 2016, we were uh, looking at the end of our contract negotiation and uh, working, bar collectively bargaining to get a new contract that would, uh, same sort of thing, right? Fair wages and working conditions. We had some academic freedom issues that we were concerned about, uh, maintaining benefits for our uh, part-time faculty, those sorts of things. We were uh, bargaining with a management that did not want to give us anything, nothing. So, you know, and I understand when I'm talking about this sort of uh, union experience that a lot of you probably aren't in unionized environments, but think about a time in your institution where you wanted to change something and the people in power said no. I don't, you know, you, we all have, I think, lots of examples of that. Um, they can be from the mundane, uh, we want to get more staplers for the reference desk to like the really big and significant, we want a new president of the university, <laughs> you know, and so all of those, and all of those things in between. So um, a time when you wanted something to, you want something to happen and power the people in power just said no. So that's what the condition we were facing, that we wanted things and management was simply saying no. Uh, and as we got to the end of the contract negotiations, they continued to say no. And what ended up happening was a lockout. So I don't know how many of you know what that is. You can Google it. I can't Google it because you're looking at my screen, but uh, look up management lockout. It is a sort of a management strike. So if we think about strikes, the project there is to withhold our labor from an employer until the, the employer gives us what we want, right? That what we have is our work. In a lockout is the reverse. Management says you can't come to work. We're going to prevent you from doing your labor here. And what that mean, meant for all of us on the faculty was that uh, on Labor Day weekend of 2016, uh, we were all collectively fired by our management. They said, unless you sign this contract, you are um, out of a job, no salary, no health insurance, you can't use your email, you can't use your uh, course management systems, can't use the library for sure, nobody can come on campus, right? The organization spent a bunch of money to get more security guards to prevent any of us from going anywhere near our offices. And if you think about your work and how much time you spend there and how much it begins to feel like home, right, that was a, a, a sort of overwhelming and shocking experience for all of us. We did not feel welcome at home. Now, for me, this was my first encounter with sort of brute power. And it maybe isn't something that you, that all of us encounter, right? Uh, a lot of us do, right? If I think about, um, people who are profiled by the police, for example, uh, and face the sort of intensity of state power when they're just walking around on the street. That wasn't something that I had ever experienced before. But in this moment, um, I understood pretty instantly what it was like to be subject to someone or something that wants to prevent you from getting the things that you need to live, to do your job, to work, all of that. So I'll talk a little bit now about what power is, um, because I think that's essential when we're talking about organizing for change, is getting some insight into the power that we have 
collectively and the power that they have. And when I say we and they, it's, um, you know, who is sort of, uh, who's in charge, right? Who can say yes or no? And so, you know, um, that's their power. So on this slide is a couple of things I'd like to talk briefly about. First is uh, power is a capacity to change the conditions of our experience. So if we want, um, I'm looking around my office right now, <laughs> you know, if I want uh, my standing, I have a standing desk in my new office and it's broken, the left side of the desk doesn't, doesn't rise up. So I can't use it and I'd like a new one, right? Power is the capacity to get a new one, right? And figuring out who could do that for me, who, what kind of case do I have to make for the value of that for myself, um, right? Rather than sitting here and believing that the desk is broken and broken for good. So power is both uh, building the capacity to make something different in our environments and also um, a sort of radical hope that we could do that, right? And I think, um, part of the, the key to organizing successfully is believing that things could be different and that we could build the capacity to make them different if we wanted to. The second point I want to make about power is that this point about we share an adversary and it is not each other. So in the context of the union struggle, our adversary was uh, the president of the university and the board of trustees who had decided that rather than give uh, a $10,000 sort of fund for adjunct health coverage, which doesn't even come close to covering that, but instead they wanted to slash that, right? So the adversary we shared was management in that moment. And I think it's important to remember uh, when we're in a project of organizing towards some kind of change that we are gonna be organizing with each other to make a demand to someone or against someone uh, else, right? One of the things that I learned in the union that really has really stuck with me is that uh, I don't have to like you or agree with you to have uh, to share a demand with you and to want to work with you to get that demand met. So one of the challenges in organizing is remembering that that even if I don't like you, you know, if, even if we disagree about everything else, in the moment where we both collectively want a new stapler, we want a new photocopier, we want to uh, never have to answer a question about scanners again. We want to, um, uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a cataloger, but I'm, I'm trying to think of a cataloging example. We want to not use RDA, say, um, thinking about, thinking about uh, the sort of collective power we're building is about uh, trying to get something that we need and not get something from each other. And the third point is that our power is um, in numbers, we have more. There are more of us than there are of them. And in points of leverage, where can we make change? And I think when we're organizing, we're always looking for both of those things. We want to know how many people we could get on board for the thing that we want to make happen. So in the context of the lockout, we did not want to bend to management's will, right? They said, you agree with us or we will fire you and leave you without health coverage even though you're pregnant and sick and whatever, right? Uh, we wanted to stand up to them and say no. So our power was that we had the numbers and we had to get the numbers in order to vote down the contract. Um, and there were more of us. There's like 10, 10 board of trustees members and one president of the university and there were 600 of us. In your library, I guarantee that I'm, I'm sure that there are more of you than there are of whatever the adversary that, that you would want to make a demand from. So that's what we have. They have more money, they have more time, right? Uh, but we have each other. And that's, I think, sometimes sounds like a bumper sticker, but I think it is really true, right? If you could get everybody in your department to go march on the, the, the dean's office and say, we're not going to use uh, I'm trying to think of the cataloging tool, <laughs> but um, if we're not going to, we, we refuse to, to switch to Alma, right? Um, you could do that if uh, you got everybody on board, uh, right? And so, so the power is in numbers. And then we're looking for where we could make change. So I was thinking about this recently in terms of assessment work, uh, where we often spend, I think, more time gathering numbers so that we can report them than we do doing the kind of work that we want to do in the library, right? And so how could I stop doing that? Um, I'm always looking sort of to stop doing that. I'm gonna take a drink of water. 
So where's the leverage there? You know, could I stop submitting assessment reports and keep my job? Not at all, right? Uh, and so that's not maybe a point of leverage, but I could perhaps make that uh, document documentation process uh, kind of easier and uh, not sort of get committed to the project as a project of truth. But if I know I have to turn it in, that wouldn't maybe be the point of resistance. Perhaps the point of resistance would be uh, something else, uh, sort of what we put in that document, uh, who's in charge of it, how we collectively share the work so that a, a difficult task um, gets completed easily. So thinking about where we can push and where we can't, um, I think is really important. So sort of, uh, I think once we begin to think of the work that we're doing as about building power and exerting it, it changes the way we, the, it has changed, at least for me, the way I think about making change in my, in my work, right? Uh, that always at the center of it is a question of power. Who has the power to move things? Is it us? If it's not us, how do we get the power to move things? And what do we want to move? And uh, where is that? where could we exert that power in a way that would be meaningful. So thinking about that, right, like we're thinking about power always in terms of how we want to win, right? We want to win something. Um, and so I think of uh, this always in the sort of frame of uh, campaign. Um, we want to find something that matters and we want to make a difference in our in our workplace. So the first thing I think we need to do is figure out what we want. Um, and we talk in the in union world about finding an issue that is widely felt and deeply held, that it's difficult to organize and get everybody sort of together and working towards a common goal if the demand, if the goal is not, uh, if it doesn't matter very much, right? So uh, I assume all of you are in this sort of organizing for change sort of pre-conference because there is something that you want to make different in your workplace. Um, so thinking through what that demand is. So for example, we might say, I want libraries to be more uh, racially diverse, right? That's a, a goal, but what's the demand, right? And that's something that's a widely felt, deeply held. I want a more diverse, I want libraries not to be as white as they've always been. I want them to look different. I want them to be welcome places for all kinds of workers and all kinds of patrons. How can I do that, right? And the demand is something that you have to come together as a group to figure out what that demand is. Because a more diverse workplace, a little bit vague. I want targeted minority hires for the next five positions we have open is a demand, right? And so figuring out what that demand is that you can go out and try to win, I think is really uh, essential. And figuring out a demand that everybody cares about. So when I started here at uh, the Graduate Center, I very quickly had a, de a demand, I had a grievance. Um, and that's just who I am. Once you go through a union fight, you just always have a fight, you know, as the fight doesn't leave you. And so I got out here and uh, I started March 18th and my vacation leave, my annual leave doesn't accrue until I have worked a full calendar month from the 1st to the 30th to the 31st. So uh, I worked for two weeks in March, but I didn't accrue any annual leave for those two weeks. Right, um, it just seemed really unfair. Like, why am I working for free? Like, I should get all the benefits for those two weeks that I'm here, right? So I was very annoyed and upset about it. And so my demand would be, right, that I uh, earn annual leave for those two weeks. That's my demand. And then I was talking with my colleagues and talking with the union here, and we determined that it wasn't an issue that was widely felt and deeply held. That People are mad about it when they initially start, but then two months into their job, they forget about it, and ultimately, you know, it comes out in the wash, right? So uh, clearly, it's unfair, but as a demand, it's not widely felt or deeply held enough. So we're not going to move on it. We're not going to organize to try to win that. Uh, it's not worth it. On the other hand, the uh, library here uh, has um, technical services, uh, or not technical services, I'm sorry, but like the, the scanners and printers, right? Used to be the domain of the librarians, and now they have been shifted to the domain of IT. This is probably common experience that you've faced. It's like the third time in my career that this has happened, that they've moved the printers and copiers from uh, librarians to IT staff, and guess what? The IT staff are bad at support. They don't see it as critical or important. 
they're not putting somebody at the desk to solve those problems immediately the way that the library might do. So one of the demands we have is that uh, we don't want to be the people who tell you we're sorry the scanner doesn't work but we don't have the power to fix it anymore. So our demand is that IT have a staff person uh, available at a face-to-face at a, at a -face service point to resolve those problems. Everybody on staff is frustrated. Everybody's mad about it. The demand is really clear. You know, and that is uh, something that we could win and something we could begin to build towards. And, you know, once you have your demand, your demand the next thing that I think about is uh, what our leverage is. Who, who do we have to move to get this uh, sort of the, to get what we want to, to happen. So think about what uh, points of uh, resistance and contestation exist. Because it isn't always going after the boss, right? Like this, you know, maybe it's not a dean issue. But maybe what we need to do is think about who in IT would share that demand. Who could we get from that office on our side who would uh, help advance our position, right? So. Um, thinking about what are strategically about who we need to have on our sides. And then this third bullet point is like so uh, short but essential and uh, hard to do and what I'll um, spend uh, sort of most of the rest of my time talking about is that we need to build super majorities through escalating actions in a campaign to win. So the thing about about organizing for change is that you have to have everybody with you, right? This point that there are more of us than there are of them. And I say it all the time because I, it's like the, sort of at the core of uh, any kind of a win you're gonna get is that you need to have everybody on your side. Um, and getting everybody on your side is about building power uh, carefully and slowly so that everybody feels capable of the sort of big step, right? So if I'm imagining what, you know, we might do, we might uh, storm the IT uh, director's office, you know, or the, the president of IT here, I'm not sure of the title, but, you know, that might be the thing we want to do at the end. But you can't ask people to do that without building a sense of collective power sort of slowly. So you can't ask people to go on strike as a first action, you have to sort of have them wear a button and put a poster on their door and have conversations with each other and begin to do uh, sort of smaller actions that build a sense of the collective, right? Um, and I think that's a really essential part of organizing is remembering that uh, the big thing that we want, we can only get if we have organized sufficiently. Um, there's a great book and if you, catch me after the webinar. I'm happy to uh, share the title with you, but uh, I'm trying to remember. It's called No Shortcuts. Uh, it's a great book and the sort of point of, uh, one of the points that the, the author makes, uh, whose name has just ran out of my head, which I apologize for, um, she makes a distinction between organizing and mobilizing. That mobilizing is the sort of sexy, hot protest out on the street that people look at and see, ooh, that's social change happening right there out on the street. But you only get a mobilization like that if you've sufficiently organized people so that they can uh, be sort of turned on uh, as a collective, as an organized collective uh, when harm comes to you in the workplace or when a big change needs to happen. So in the lockout, and I'll change slides, this is one of the things that we did. So we wanted to do, um, an unemployment action. So here's a picture of uh, that unemployment action. Uh, so everybody been locked out. They're all college professors. None of them have been on Jane McAlevey. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, Jane McAlevey's No Shortcuts is the book. Uh, that's fantastic. Um, but uh, here is the sort of picture of that action. So none of these people have been unemployed for a long, long time. Most of them are tenured faculty. Uh, they see themselves as scholars. We see ourselves as part of uh, a world that is not work, right? Um, so nobody had ever been unemployed or they hadn't been unemployed for a real, real long time. So one of the actions we did is we thought, well, we'll get everybody here uh, downtown uh, to sign up for unemployment. And it serves a couple of purposes. First, I can uh, build the sort of thick connections that people need um, 
in order to do collective action, right? We don't we don't take action with strangers. We take action with people that we know and that we trust, and that has to be built together, and it has to be built in person. I was uh, just in Canada on a panel about uh, organized labor with uh, Kelly McElroy, who's at um, uh, the Oregon State, and uh, she we made this little, great little bingo card, and one of them was that nothing happens over email, nothing. So you can send an email, nothing. You have to organize face-to-face uh, -face the way that we build connections by spending time together. So I don't know if uh, there are people in the webinar that you have a group of you watching this right now. That's a, a sort of organizing activity, getting everyone together. So I want to get everyone together and also meet some of the real needs that people had. You know, the lockout ended up lasting 15 days, but we didn't know it was going to last 15 days. We thought, oh, this could last six months. You know, this could last a year. Uh, and we're looking at not having rent um, next month, and that was very scary. So I got everyone here uh, to sign up for unemployment, and guess what? The librarian's totally essential to this project. All we do all day, you know, help people navigate interfaces that are clunky and hard to use. And if you think that the that library interfaces are clunky and hard to use, try um, uh, an, your unemployment sign-up interface or any many of the government services that people needed. So we got everyone together and uh, this is about building power. So this picture turns into this picture. So I think when we think of social change, when we think of organizing for, for to make a big difference, we think of this sort of thing. That is a picture of one of our student activists. He organized the students to support the faculty in this uh, lockout. That's the bullhorn from my colleague Catherine's Little League team uh, that we use to sort of shout the signs. I support my LAUF prof professors. Those came from our uh, parent union, uh, NYSET AFT, who made those signs for us. Um, but this starts here, and this starts here. So one of the things we were doing is building lists. So this is uh, maybe a little bit boring, but I'll talk about it for a second. Um, it, it becomes, I think, quite exciting, right? So uh, when we're organizing, we want to build a supermajority. And how do I get a supermajority? I have to know how many people that I need to have on my side, and that's usually a countable number. It might be the number of people in your union. That was what it was for us. It might be the number of people in your department, the number of people um, in uh, the library. Uh, that wants to, wants to push for a change. And so what you what we did was we made a list of every single faculty member. We got their phone number, their address. Uh, we didn't get their t-shirt size. And this is if I had one regret from the way we responded in the lockout. I'll, I'll never forget it. We had this, now I'll never forget this, this uh, sort of throwaway moment in a meeting where we said, well, we need to gather information from everyone in case this goes on for a long time. We didn't, we couldn't use our, our university email anymore, right? So we needed everybody's private email. We needed everyone's private phone number. And I said, we should get everybody's t-shirt size. And people were like, no, 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 we don't need the t-shirt size. So we ended up not having anyone's t-shirt size. And guess what? That meant we couldn't order everybody t-shirts. Get the t-shirt size. Nothing's more powerful than being in a t-shirt and then being in a group of 100 other people all wearing the same t-shirt. It's a kind of low level uh, action you know, people who don't want to do this, don't want to stand outside, don't want to take that kind of risk. Uh, pretty much everybody will wear a t-shirt. Um, so yeah, that would be one thing I'd write down, get everybody a t-shirt. If we think about the teacher uh, walkouts, the teacher strikes in uh, all over the country, I think what's most powerful is seeing a sea of red shirts, right? You're like, wow everybody is together. So get the t-shirt size. Anyway, so we made lists of everyone and we had assessments. So when we assess uh, members of a unit, trying to think about where they stand on the question of the demand. I wanna see, uh, so if my demand is, uh, in this case, our demand was vote no on the contract. Right? We wanted people to say no. We thought that we that would be very powerful for us, and uh, we didn't want like being bullied like that. So uh, we made a list of everyone, and then we did an assessment one, that's sort of a one to five scale. Uh, on the side of the ones are uh, people who 
agree with your position and are organizing for it, talking to other people, trying to convince them to go along, right? Uh, handing out buttons, handing out t-shirts, getting people to sign petitions, active, engaged members uh, of the collective who are organizing in the same way that you are. On the other end is a five. Fives are people who are also handing out buttons, t-shirts, getting petitions signed, but they're arguing for the opposite position. So we had people in the union who wanted to vote yes on the contract and people who want to vote no on the contract. Um, and for every action, people who want to hold the the um, want to hold a picket line, people who don't, right? So you always have on uh, you'll have the like people on both poles. So in this case, I was a one, and Michael Peely as my <laughs> nemesis was a five, and we were both doing frantic organizing work to try to get people to agree with us, trying to build super majorities within the union for the position that we held. So ones and fives, and then everyone else is in the middle. So a two is someone who agrees with my position but isn't actively organizing people for it. Pretty sure they're gonna vote with me. They're a solid vote for me, for my position. The, they'll show up in a t-shirt, but they won't get other people to wear t-shirts, right? So that's the difference sort of between a one and a two. A five and a four, the five, uh, you know, the four is gonna show up and wear that guy's t-shirts and wear Michael's t-shirts, um, and then there are threes. And the struggle is to try to get a supermajority that we could count of people who would be ones and twos that I know are going to vote with me or show up at an action with me, right? Um, and so when you're organizing, you're in a constant state of assessing and finding out where people are. And it's like you just build a spreadsheet, right? So you're also testing all of these actions or tests for power, right? So if you look at, at this unemployment action, we checked off who came to that, right? Because if I call you and I say, hey, uh, we're all gathering for this unemployment action. Can you come down? And you say yes, and you don't show up. I know you're not committed, right? I know you're a three. You're on the fence. You could go either way. The twos are always going to show up to the unemployment action, and the ones are calling their friends and getting them to come down. And so for every action, you're building that assessment so that you always have a sense and you know how uh, things are going to go. Because when you have an action, nothing should be a surprise. You should have a sense pretty clearly of what the vote is going to be, of how many people are going to show up, um, who's going to speak up in a meeting about an issue that you're having. Uh, you want to know that going in. So once you sort of get in the organizing mindset, you're always sort of having these assessment sorts of conversations with people and with yourself and sort of thinking about who, do you have the numbers yet for the thing that you want to have happen? So this was large scale, right? Like, are we going to have a contract or not? Am I going to be able to go to work or not? Will I have a salary or not? But think about uh, other sorts of lower level sort, sorts of things you might do in a meeting, say, right? So, um, uh, you know, if I've got 10 people in my department and we all want to, one of the issues we had at my old library, and it will sound probably silly to some of you, but we had, um, we had uh, copy machines for student use, but they also functioned as scanners. But for some reason, the director of the library didn't want to turn on the scanning function. It's a totally mundane example, but they happen every day. And so what would the supermajority look like to get the, if our demand is turn on the scanning function, how many people in my library have to speak up at a staff meeting to say, you know, we need this to turn on so that our chorus is so loud that the director has to say yes. Right, um, and that's accomplished through uh, knowing each other really well, through having one-on-one -on -one conversations about uh, the scanner, about other kinds of workplace issues, and then you know keeping a list of everybody and understanding whether or not they're going to go with you on the question of the scanner. Right? Are they ones, twos, threes, fours, and fives? And we're always trying to move people over to our side, trying to make fives, fours, fours, threes make those threes like guaranteed to show up in the t-shirt, and then the twos turn into ones. Get the ones, as many ones as you can, organizing each other, talking to each other, hey, we have to say, we have to stand up and say in the meeting, all of us together, turn on the scanner, right? <laughs> and once I have a super majority, I've got 10 people in my department, and eight of them are gonna say, stand up and say that, I know that that's something that I can, I can demand. 
uh, and that I am likely uh, to achieve. So that's sort of the assessment point. Uh, I think keeping lists is absolutely essential to making change. Um, right, so I want to just talk uh, for a couple minutes about this action. So, uh, so when we're building power, uh, we also have to build people's sense that they have some control over their situation. So as I was talking earlier in the presentation about believing that we have the capacity to make things different. And uh, that's not something everyone feels all the time. It may not be something that you feel all the time. It's certainly not something that I feel all the time, right? But like, if the boss says, this is just how we do things here, I guess it's just how we do things here, you know? Uh, but people have to believe that things can be different, that they have power to do that. So one of the things that happened at this unemployment action is that it got everybody together in one room. So uh, being together is really essential to making change and to building trust with one another so that we believe that we could make change happen. Once they fired us, nobody was going to be in the office. You know, no, was gonna, could, there's no hallway where we can see each other. There's no... Um, faculty lounge anymore because we've been removed from our institution and so we had to build places find places where we could get together uh, and run into each other and see each other and talk to each other so this action was the biggest that we had during the lockout i think 120 people came uh, to help each other um, and you can see sort of the uh, my colleagues talking to one another. So this is uh, one of our adjunct faculty in social, uh, social work, uh, Arthur over here with the white hair, and he's talking to uh, Randy who is uh, in the psychology department. They don't work together, they don't know each other, uh, but because we had everyone together in a room, they could help each other and begin to get to know each other. And you know, uh, not everybody wants to do the big strike action. Nobody, you know, not everybody feels comfortable with that. So I think this is why we got more people here than we did on any of the picket lines that we ran. So you'll always have, uh, you know, when you're organizing, you people begin to sort of come out of central casting, which is kind of interesting. There's always, there's always a Syed. And so uh, Syed was a, a guy in the soci sociology department who I worked with, and he didn't want to come to the unemployment action because he said, we need to be out in front of the building fighting the administration, right? We need to be out there yelling. You know, we really believe that we need to be out there. Um, and he wasn't wrong about that. We did, but you got to get everybody together if you're going to get them out there yelling, right? So uh, we're sitting here, Syed calls from the campus where he's the sort of lone guy with the picket sign and says, hey, the students are walking out. We didn't know they were walking out. We had no idea what they were doing. We were consumed as, and rightly so, with organizing each other and ourselves. Um, but then Syed calls and he's like, the students are walking out. And everybody in the room stood up. It was like a moment out of a movie. It's never happened before since in my life. It was like magic. Everybody stood up and said, we got to go over there. And uh, because we had everyone gathered together in a space that felt safe and like something worth doing that was not threatening and not scary, everyone was able to feel that moment of having a collective shared feeling that we needed to go and stand with the students and say, we're not going to accept a contract just because you're bullies, right? They're, we, they're, we're going to fight back as a collective. And it was a really magic moment. Um, and everybody got up. We were at this cafe that let us in it's like a socialist it's run by a socialist so they like let the the start the, the locked out workers and the strikers come and uh use their space and we all stood up and walked over and we joined the joined the students in this moment um so i think that's uh, uh this moment when you're when you're standing together and and getting a win which we which we ultimately did uh really changes the relationships between people and changes um, how uh, how you can relate to one another and what you imagine is possible with one another. Um, and it's really a, a power, it's a powerful thing and it's something that I think librarians can make happen. And if you look at who, who makes things happen in movements like this, it is often the secretaries and the librarians because the skills that are required to get to this place where people feel like they have the capacity to change the relationships 
relationships to their employers is uh, built by this, which is what we do all day. So in my job, I'm an instruction librarian, um, and I uh, set up the instruction calendar for the year, and I get uh, faculty to bring their classes in, and I get librarians to agree to teach those classes, right? Uh, I set up a calendar, I make meetings, I make agendas, and these are probably things that you do as well, right? You uh, build systems every day, you make lists, you log information, uh, you track things over time. Uh, you make sure that uh, all the moving parts in a, in a, in a project implementation plan are, are, are going. And that's what it takes to organize uh, for the kind of social change that, that, that we tried to make happen at LIU. So uh, I think that librarians, because we're good at that, because we're good at talking to one another, we're good at talking to people and having conversations and uh, figuring out what people need, right serving uh communities that this is uh these are all organizing skills that we can use for projects that are sort of bigger than that so uh we've got about 20 minutes i want to just point to some resources um that have been really essential to me uh first is uh yeah and please ask some questions because i would love to you know it's one of, one of the things we have in the union movement is like the 80-20 rule. I listen 80% of the time and talk 20% of the time. Uh, so it's always a little strange to like talk 80% of the time about the union and listen 20% of the time. So um, please do if you have questions or stories that you want to share, I hope you'll put them in the chat box. Uh, but resources that I think are essential. First is that I often, often when I I'm talking to people about their workplaces, they'll say, oh, I got a bad union. I couldn't do that because my union's terrible. My union sucks. Uh, they're no good, they don't care about me. Um, you are the union. And that is not, it's a bumper sticker. I know it's like a t-shirt, you are the union, but you are, right? The union exists as a, as a set of structures and, and uh, systems that you could take as your own. So one of the things we did after the lockout, and it's a long, boring story, and if you wanna hear it, I'm, let's call me on the phone where I can tell you the whole long story, but we ended up uh, getting back into work having another contract fight, we kept negotiating, and it was very, very challenging, and uh, turned out that the union was not as strong as we needed it to be, and uh, a bunch of us decided we needed to take it over. We felt that negotiations hadn't gone well, and we felt they hadn't gone well because we weren't in charge. Um, so uh, one of the things we did was get ourselves in charge. So I was uh, managed to make myself president, my slate, you know, I ran with a slate of people who uh, shared the same sort of feeling that the union should be democratic uh, in the workplace, and we took it over. And it's possible to do, and uh, it happens uh, all the time, and it's an essential sort of thing to do. And that's a demand you can make. This union needs to represent my interests better, so I'm gonna be it. Uh, I think it's really important. So the resources that we used were uh, Labor Notes, uh, which is a sort of a funny name for a, a an organization that helps people build the skills necessary to take over their units. And their website is full of amazing resources. And if you would like more information about specifically union stuff, I have a book that I'm happy to send to you just uh, after the uh, webinar, give me your address and I'll drop one in the mail, um, called Secrets of a Successful Organizer that sort of walks you step by step through how to build a campaign uh, for something that you want. Um, and Jane McAlevey's No Shortcuts, the name of the book that I forgot a bit earlier in the presentation, uh, is a fantastic, super readable story about how power works and how to organize it. Uh, I documented everything during the lockout at my blog, so there's a link there um, if you want to read more about uh, what happened and how that felt. And then this last bullet point I really is really real for me. Um, if you want to be doing some organizing in your workplace, if you want to be making some change and not sure how to get started, uh, I'm no genius, right? I am just learning as I go. Like I said, next year we're going to get there earlier. We've been standing out with the stickers in front of the venue instead of at the subway exits. And so next time we're going to get there early and we're going to stand by the subway. Anyway, uh, I'm always available to talk with you about um, things you might be thinking about trying. I don't believe anything matters more than building the kind of thick connections with one another uh, that can make the kind of world that we want to live in possible. Uh, so uh, hit me up and we'll set, set up a time to just chat about that.
so that's sort of what I had to share with you today. Uh, we have some time for questions, um, and so I would love to hear from uh, any of you. Uh, if you have questions or, or, or thoughts you'd like to share. Yeah, great. Thank you, Emily. Um, so like Emily said, we do have time for questions, and so you can use the question panel on your GoToWebinar little square there to enter them, or if you just have any kind of responses you'd like to give Emily anything to share. Um, so we'll start with one. So to understand the importance of you know, meeting and getting people together, but do you have any suggestions for those who work remotely? Oh, um, so like not working with in a in a physical workspace. You know, I think it's actually one of the one of the things that's challenging is that the sort of uh, transformation of work to uh, sort of you're alienated from your colleagues. As I you know, I think it it makes it harder. I would say um, I find video chat to be extremely useful um, and so you know finding time to to get together where you can see each other's faces and there are lots of technologies for that so um, getting together virtually but in real time synchronous time when you can when you can actually chat with each other I think is essential All right great um, the next one is what advice do you have for librarians and library staff in non-unionized workplaces in union hostile right to work states who want to organize for change at work yeah I mean I think we all live in that space now right yeah. since this uh, Supreme Court ruling that made it essentially all um, all public sector unions uh, uh, took away the agents I don't want to get too much in the weeds but we all live essentially in a right to work environment right now um, so I have a couple things to say about that first is that uh, organizing making demands you can do that through lots of other kinds of structures so the union gives you some you know, there's like some legal framework for that but uh, I think you can organize without a union for things that you want which is what you know I'm really you know emphasize like you in the meeting where we want them to turn on the machine you know that's an organizing opportunity um, if you want your library dean to to implement targeted minority hires in your library that's you know you can make that demand outside of a union context the other thing I would say is that you know we've seen a bunch of labor actions by uh, teachers uh, lately who are not uh, who live in right-to-work states and don't have unions and so you know I look at to the West Virginia teachers union as a as a real example that's a right-to-work state um, but it's got a memory of union work from from the coal mining days you know and uh, yeah sometimes you have to do things that are illegal and uh, you can you know you learn during uh, a, a labor thing that the law is is about what, you know whether or not you can you know whether or not you get to decide what's going to happen with it right like the law doesn't seem to apply to the president of the United States right like so you know you can do illegal things I guess I would say all right um, next one is what do you do if there's actually fewer of you than those that hold the power oh shoot yeah well I wonder if you know we should talk about that particular situation Whoever is asking that question, but also I think um, looking for allies uh, who would be part of you, expanding the definition of you. So one of the things that we talked about at LIU is that we had our demands as workers there, but we were also the university is located in a gentrifying area of downtown Brooklyn, and the sort of extraction of of, of property value, which is sort of what was happening at the university that has a lot in common with people who lived in nearby public housing projects who are uh, you know facing eviction uh, so that the public private partnerships could build big luxury condos there was a grocery store that um, got closed down the only grocery store in the neighborhood got shut down um, for a couple of years and turned into a gourmet grocery store right so thinking about ways to link your demands and in your experiences with others who may not be in your unit as you see it but share similar concerns um, that could be part of that collective you're building it's hard though yeah um, all right thank you and then we do have some extra time so if the person who submitted that question did want to was willing to and felt comfortable sharing a little more about their situation and wanted to do that we can share that with Emily um, so what do you have suggestions for what one would do if those who are in power are 
their office is unable to be stormed. They're untouchable. They're <laughs> board of directors who aren't actually there. You know, they it's it's they're not untouchable. I don't know. The board of directors is like not there, but they're somewhere. You know, so it it does I think you know uh, require being a little bit creative. I think and uh, thinking about where their offices are. So in, during the lockout, uh, Kim Klein is the president there, and she. Uh, just nothing phased her. She didn't care about anything. And she was just like, yeah, you know, we had one faculty member whose husband had uh, end-stage lung cancer and was suddenly thrown off a healthcare plan. Um, st stories like that where you're like, wow, what kind of a monster do you have to be to not respond to that? And the only thing that got her was we had a phone campaign where people, we had people call her office and demand a fair contract for uh, LA Brooklyn workers. And somebody found her uh, her daughter's cell phone number, her adult daughter's cell phone number. And some of the calls started getting routed there. And it really, really made her super mad. <laughs> it was like the sort of thing that, you know, you're not, it, it's like, uh, they are real people. They do exist somewhere. They stuff bugs them. She doesn't like it when when people say things in public about her outfits, you know. Um, so petty stuff. Uh, sort of finding finding that you know they're somewhere. They're somewhere you could go storm them. And that's I think kind of fun to think about. I don't know. I could go on. <laughs> All right. Um, do you have suggestions for getting the word out? So when you organized the unemployment action and you all didn't have your faculty emails anymore, like, did you rely on word of mouth? Did you use social media? How did you spread word to contact those who you contact you might not already have? Um, that's a good question. Uh, it's a lot of conversations. So you might know, not know how to get the word out, but uh, somebody does. It's trying to, f you're trying to always figure out who is the person who could transmit this information. Like who's the, who's the, the gossip, right? There's somebody in your office who always seems to know everything, right? So finding that person. Um, but it's, it's most, it's just a ton of conversations and a ton of face-to-face -face conversations. So, uh, yeah, I don't think there's, and you know, that's why I think Jane McAlevey's book is so essential, right? That there are really no shortcuts. So the ways that you would do that would be uh, talking to people, figuring out who knows somebody in the press. So the way that our story sort of blew up um, when there are lots and lots of management actions every day that are just atrocious and appalling. And I think the reason that we got so much attention was because it was Labor Day weekend and a friend of mine was trying to be a writer and she was sort of interning at the nation and even though she was a grown-up and but, you know they wanted her to write some kind of a story and she was just like hanging out that weekend and I called her and told her what was happening she was like oh let me see if I can write a story about this and once we had a story there was something other people could link to you know um, yeah it's a it's a lot of accidents but those accidents only emerge if you if you're talking to people all the time yeah Okay, thank you. And then we do have one more question. Okay. Um, in, organi in your organizing action at LIU, did people you had identified early on as ones or twos or threes or fives ever change, or did they remain relatively fixed in their stances? And if they did change, how did you bring about those changes? Yeah, that's, um, that's an interesting question. So, you know, you're assessing people vis-a-vis -vis an action. So you might have people who are ones on your demand to uh, so we had people who were who were ones on the demand to uh, vote down the original contract, and eight months later they were fives, arguing. So so the demand changed. So initially the demand was say no to the contract, and then the next demand was uh, say yes to the contract, right? Um, and so people sort of moved around in that. Uh, so thinking about the the second. Um, the second push to sign a contract, which was sort of stressful and challenging, but uh, the people, I had people change, right? So I was a, for me, I wanted us to sign the contract and I was able to turn some fives into ones by talking to them, uh, by saying, oh, what do you imagine will happen if we vote down the contract? What do you need to hear, if, uh, you know, what does a contract need to have for you to vote yes? Uh, questions, you know, helping people sort of 
uh, sort of come around to my position, which was, you know, just having a conversation with them about why I why I had the position I had, why do you hold the position you do, um, and unpacking that a little bit. Uh, so it's just like conversations, you know. And then people, it's like any other sort of part of work, you have clicks in the workplace, right? So people solidified into these masses. Um, and and once they were once they were in in those sort of groups, it was hard to separate them. Uh, but you just always have to be talking, which I know I keep saying, but that's the the sort of trick I think to all of this. The secret to all of it is uh, building connections uh, with people so that they trust you. Um, when we uh, talk about leadership, it's interesting because you know there's lots of leadership training and libraries and you know leadership institutes for a week or whatever. But uh, in the union movement, a leader is somebody other people follow. So figuring out who the leaders are um, and getting them on your side is essential. So Michael's my nemesis because he was a leader. Everybody followed him, you know. <laughs> it's like and I wanted them to follow me, and I was profoundly unsuccessful in my efforts to get them to follow me. Instead, I think I peeled one off, and that was it. Uh, because they just they had thick connections with him. Yeah. All right, great. Thank you. That was an excellent way to wrap all this up. Um, thank you again for your presentation, Emily, and thank you to all our attendees. This will conclude today's presentation. Um, you all attendees will soon receive a short online evaluation form. So if you could please take a few minutes to fill that out. The answers and your comments do help us plan future events. And your email will also include links to today's slides and recording, so the information Emily had on her last couple slides that will be available. And you also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance, and that information will be included in the email as well. And thank you once again to our presenter, Emily Drabinski, and to members of the ELECT Continuing Education Committee, the ELECT Office, and to the ELECT Program Committee. Alex has two pre-conference events taking place at ALA Annual on June 21st, so please check the website for details and registration on those. And then we also have another ELECT virtual pre-conference next week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, once again, thank you all for joining us, and this will conclude our session.